Okay, so uh, I hope everyone's having a great BSD CAN 2017. I certainly am. This is my first time here. Um, the goal for the talk is to actually have questions at the end. So I'm going to motor through this as fast as I can. And um, short interjections are fine. Just stick your hand up or shout something out. I'll roll with it. Um, but save your longer stuff for, for the end. Um, yeah, so I'm a New Zealander, which means my English is possibly hard for you to understand. Stick your hand up if that's the problem, um, or just listen to the video. The slides are up on the um, conference website. Go to the schedule, find the talk, click on the download link, um, so you can read it there in case I have problems. We're missing like the corner of the screen, but hey. Um, this is from New Zealand, this picture in the background. Um, there's a few of those scattered around. Sometime I hope you go have a chance to come and see my great country. So, I'm Dave Cottlehuber. This is a clickbait troll link from microservices to monoliths. And um, it's, I suppose it's really about, fundamentally about distributed systems and how bad they are in practice. Um, and if you can avoid them, you should. And if, you, if you're not ready for it, you'll end up where we were. So, um, I work for a little company called I Want My Name. And um, we'd really like it if you're a Twitter person that you tweet uh, hi, I want my name, I'm at the conference, Dave is wonderful. The last bit is optional, but the first bit is not. Um, the more tweets, the happier uh, the business people are, and the more trips and conferences we get to go to. Okay, so we're a domain, oh sorry, yeah, about this talk, why we migrated into what, um, a little bit about migrating and building our, our own source, because one of the nice things about the BSD world is you can do that really easy yourself. Um, a bit on the architecture, a bit about how we move the back end, Interlude 1, how I had to roll back moving the back end and try it again. Um, the bat belt, sort of the basics of how we keep our system secure and up to date. Um, a little bit about cluster and jail internals, um, at least how we use them. Interlude 2, how I broke some stuff, rolled back and had to fix it again. Um, and there's some stuff about metrics and monitoring, which for me as an ops person really is my bread and butter. The holy trinity, backups, monitoring, log files. Uh, and then probably patching, yeah. Um, and then finally, inter interlude three, another problem uh, where I had to go back and fix some stuff, and then some time for talks at the end. So, we're a handcrafted artisanal domain reseller. We have a shelf of, of typeface um, in the office, and we carefully pick out every domain name you request on the internet. It's polished, it's delivered, it's shipped. They're beautiful. You should get domains from us. Um, our Probably our main point of differentiator is that we do these things for real people, and to an extent, um, this community are not really real people. Um, we are way past um, dealing with DNS problems. We make the DNS problems for other people. That's our bread and butter. Uh, this is for um, families, for grandmas, for photographers. Um, anybody who goes, I want an email and a website. What is this domain thing, and why do I need it? Uh, and we make a real effort to help people. We're an ethical business, which is quite unusual these days, unfortunately and we like a simple interface. Um, as I said before, I'm a New Zealander, we're a global distributed team. I think there are 14 of us, three in Canada, there's some, some Stockholm, we're all over the place. So we live distributed systems and we're a distributed company as well. Um, our stack as of um, two years ago is a Perl Catalyst front end, which was leading age tech um, a decade ago. And it's showing a bit of its age uh, when we fork multiple workers um, to handle eight concurrent requests, we use eight gigabytes of RAM, and that's kind of, yeah, that, that's got to go. Um, we're very much an Erlang backend and have been for a while. RabbitMQ is a messaging um, service uh, written in Erlang, Apache CouchDB, um, a NoSQL distributed database <coughs> written in Erlang, and our custom search app is written in Erlang again. So I'll keep mentioning that, and you should go home and start learning it immediately. We use a session store called Kyoto Tycoon, which is a lot less known. Um, it's written in C, it's very fast. It provides a binary API and a pretty standard REST-ish um, API. And the main reason why we use it is because it runs on multiple nodes. So we can have this clustered arrangement where it doesn't matter which node you talk to, you should get more or less the same result. Um, very much how people use Redis today. Two years ago, we had 20 Debian unstable VMs. And I use the word U here with a capital U because that is the distribution we'd chosen to ship our software on. And I would say most of the time that was probably okay, but this year, uh, that time, um, it was OpenSSL, 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 OpenSSL. 
And I didn't write up in the slides because I thought it was so obvious. Um, part of our new free BSD stack is Libra is to sell all the way. And I have to say, I wish I'd had that a year ago. Um, it really introduced um, a lot of variability into our stack. So the problem we were facing is continual patches because of OpenSSL, and you couldn't really build a production system that was the same as the test environment. And that fundamentally meant that if you're tracking down any complicated problem, you're basically screwed. There's no way to do it. Um, in particular, one called Net um, HTTP. So the particular version of Perl, I think it was 5.24 RC2, changed um, net HTTP from um, a blocking call to a non-blocking call, and at the same time introduced um, an error where if the remaining, pa the, the remaining packet on the socket was exactly 124 bytes long, it deadlocked. And I won't tell you how long it took me to sort that out, but it wasn't really a fun night. Um, and that was really the moment where I went back and, and ranted on um, our HipChat channel, you can't make me do it, I'm not doing this stuff again, we have to move away. And some other people said yes, which was a relief. Yeah, so the bigger picture, um, 20 VMs, all doing different things. Request comes in the front, front end of the website. We make a couple of calls to um, our back end servers, to our session cache. We collect some stuff from external APIs. And there's a lot of latency. Cumulatively, well, individually, the latency isn't great. But cumulatively, it was, it was really long. It was painfully long, both for our users and for us. The um, cloud provider we were using had a lot of what I loosely called VM-induced network ind instability, or, or perhaps more politely, crap. Um, and that was really bad, and that was affecting us almost every week. We would have some form of outage that was triggered by um, losing SSH sessions, um, losing connectivity between our servers, and it required manual intervention to restart stuff and um, potential downtime for customers. The downside of this is, again, because it's a distributed system, when you have one part of it that stops, um, it builds up a queue of requests. And an obvious thing the computer does, we just put a little four while loop around that, while network is down, hammer it repeatedly until it comes back up. And that strategy doesn't work. In fact, it doesn't work so well that it exhausts all the TCP um, ephemeral ports on the server that's doing the requesting. It also hits when the other server comes back up before the database is ready, it hits that as well. And in fact, then the outage spreads from being a relatively short, um, maybe a few seconds micro outage from a network point of view, spreads into turning everything off because they're all trying to reconnect so quickly. And on top of that, because we were using SSH tunnels, you couldn't SSH in to fix the problem either. So you had to log into a console. Um, and that really wasn't fun. Um, and finally, uh, as a result of our choice of Debian stable, a Debian unstable, we really had an upgrade hell problem. We couldn't go back once we started upgrading, uh, and we couldn't go forward. So we'd have an open SSL patch, we'd decide to employ it, um, we'd find that there were some problems in our underlying um, Perl libraries, and we'd have to troubleshoot that in production, uh, which is the wrong way to do it. I think we all know that. And so this is fine dog. Uh, that was pretty much the way it was for a year. This is fine, <coughs> we're working on it. And then um, finally we said, let's move. So, onwards. Choose wisely. Uh, now, I wouldn't be at a BSD CAN conference if I told you we'd just gone to Debian Stable and then, uh, and then left it at that. So obviously we picked something else. Um, and we really wanted the holy grail. We wanted everything. We wanted um, reliable and custom packages. So that's Perdria and building our own base system. Easy rollback for DBs and upgrades, and um, with ZFS and boot environments, that really, is, that really is cheating. It was just too easy. We switched from Puppet to Ansible, which fundamentally I've got nothing against either tool personally, um, but we're not a big company and we don't have full-time sysadmins. So Ansible is one of those things that if you can read a shell script and you can look up some documentation, you can probably hack in the three or four small changes you need yourself without needing to go to the expert and, and beg for assistance. And, and that's a big advantage. Um, we also want a robust, transparent failover for apps and backends, and we didn't have that in our old cluster environment. And effectively, the way we dealt with that is uh, use CARP, two freebies, no, physical nodes sitting in the same uh, data center, and um, let CARP do its magical magic. And everything's fine after that. Um, we used S-Pipe D tunnels for resilience, and this was probably the first bit of BSD code that actually got introduced into our Debian environment, ripping out the auto SSH tunnels and replacing it with S-Pipe-D um, from Colin Percival. It was much faster, it was much more stable, um, 
but there was a surprise, which I'll cover later. Um, and of course, it was a surprise in production. Uh, so, so there you go. But um, it at least meant that when we were having these micro network outages, it would recover by itself most of the time. Um, and also, um, if there was a problem and the, and the tunnel hadn't come up, at least our SSH connections were still free and we could work um, as normal sysadmins do when we, when we hook into the box. So the big picture is three physical machines, a sysadmin backup box with Poudre for building ports, um, things like logging and monitoring located in that, and that was the first box we converted, moved all of our um, logging across to that, and um, A and B cluster nodes and a few scattered VMs during migration uh, because that just makes life easier. Move them off Debian onto FreeBSD, and then when everything's sorted, move them onto the cluster. So, first up, Poudrier. Um, how many people are familiar with Poudrier? Lots of people, and um, probably with Git as well. You don't have to smile, you just have to be familiar with it. It's not the same thing. <laughs> um, we could probably have done this with Subversion, but to be honest, I, I use Git a lot more. And basically what we have is, on the right here, you can see we've got a custom fork of the FreeBSD ports tree, and then a bunch of um, things which are things that we're interested in, that we keep, that we're up to date with. Here we added a dependency for some software that we used that was missing. Um, here we waited three months for a patch to land, so it finally did, so I could remove it from our ports tree. Um, grab the library SSL patch um, as soon as it lands, and one for HA proxy because HA proxy needs a patch to support library SSL. And we just keep these patches um, on our own tree, and periodically, when it suits us, not when um, upstream decides, we, we pull in all the recent changes, bump our ports and packages up to the latest version, and there'll be two or three of ours that float up to the top, and then we rebuild everything, spin up an extra node, test stuff, make sure it works, and then not in production, when we're ready, we can switch over. And that was just heaven. Um, I think probably I was the only person who cared about that, but it was great. Um, and paradoxically, the, probably the most important thing is the one we actually haven't really sorted out yet, which is guaranteed consistency across dev and prod. We don't really have development VM machines fully sorted out yet. Migration was the key thing and the next stage is getting dev VMs. But knowing you've got consistent packages and versions of everything is the first step to troubleshooting things reliably. So, architecture. You're not supposed to be able to read all the little dots and numbers here, that's okay. It's just the general picture. Uh, the rabbit in the middle is RabbitMQ. Um, that's connected by tunnels everywhere. So, um, between the nodes, between our monitoring and logging box here and um, the RabbitMQ server up here, a bunch of um, things doing dns -y things, small boxes doing DS DNS, they all converse over RabbitMQ, and then right up the top we've got the two cluster nodes sitting in the same data centre. Um, CARP and LACP, IP failover, and um, HA proxy in front of them, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment, but that's the general picture you've got to keep in your mind. Two big boxes, 40 cores, um, and enough memory to fit the entire database in RAM and all of its indexes in RAM. Um, and that really makes a big difference for speed alone, so it's kind of cool. So fundamentally from a tech perspective, I like boring things. I like things that I've used for many years that I know and I trust, and I like older versions of them. I like other people to discover the bugs in production and then complain about it on the mailing list. And the only piece that we introduced that wasn't really in, directly in that category was HA proxy. Um, it's been around for a long time, and the way we use it is that we have um, a number of services that have um, a CARP IP attached to them, so they can float between our two cluster nodes. In some cases, there are two CARP IPs so that we can have load balance traffic between um, the two front ends. And the services, CouchDB, um, Kyoto Tycoon, and RabbitMQ, actually, the, the jails actually connect to an internal HI, HA proxy IP, and then HA proxy says, if the service you want is running locally and is available, then I'll send you there, and if not, I'll stick you through the tunnel, um, S, the S-pipe D tunnel to the other box. And that works um, brilliantly, so brilliantly that I can just patch stuff and reboot boxes as far as I know without my colleagues knowing. Um, and that was really the goal of it. Um, that's proved really good. And the other surprising benefit that I've not considered is that a number of our older um, libraries and software were using HTTP 1.0 uh, to connect to the server. And then it would disconnect. It would make another request and disconnect. 
And with HA proxy, HA proxy being a proxy, we have one leg speaking 1.0 to the, to the crappy app, and then the other end connecting to the server to the back end um, with maybe three persistent connections. And the first time I migrated and I was looking at this, I was panicking, I was going, I'm supposed to have 100 connections from the, to the back end and I only see three, what have I missed? And then I was thinking, how does our app even function like this? That's, how is that possible? Um, but it turns out that alone is a big, big speed win. Um, HA proxy is very good at handling many concurrent connections, and then we have one nice, fast, persistent, open TCP connection, which may or may not be through a tunnel. So that was great. We're probably due for an interlude about now. Oh, we are, yes. So, like any good sysadmin, I did load testing, and I doubled the amount of connections, and put SPIPE-D in place, and it all looked great. So we started the DB migration, and um, as I'm one of the uh, authors of CouchDB, uh, I was pretty confident about that. Um, pride comes before fall. So we migrated the data across and started to switch servers over. And the way we did that was switch an SPIPE-D tunnel from the old database across to the new one. The database is replicating, so we're not losing uh, data in this process. And little by little migrated a few safe servers across, then slightly more complicated ones, then the app servers, and then right at the end, the, the last one, which is what I think of as the money application, it's the one where people search for domain names, migrated that across and it wouldn't work. And of course that's after about like six hours of shuffling things around. So I look at my checklist and go, okay, back we go, put it all back and then go and do some research. What have I missed? Um, yeah, so rolled back, reviewed logs. Um, I think on the next slide I actually have the picture. Um, I applied a whole lot of tweaks to the FreeBSD network stack because as a sysadmin I obviously blame the network first before looking at my own stuff. Um, and it was looking good so the next day I uh, migrated it all and me and my wife went off to watch Rogue One. Um, and the cinema incidentally is underground which I would not considered at the time. Um, there's no cell phone reception there. Um, yeah, so the, these um, refusal of new connections um, um, continued to occur while I was watching the film thinking everything was bliss. Um, listen queue overflow. And what's kind of weird is that there's some large number of hits. You should be able to look it up, um, I think, with fstat or um, one of the other tools, and then see what process is failing to handle connections. So I couldn't find that. Um, and so I did the usual thing, collected all the information I could, um, all the stuff that I thought might, might be useful, sent along to um, task the uh, SPIP D mailing list, and am I using it correctly? There are about 100. And Colin's very kind reply was, yeah, you just need to change the config option. Um, ironically, that's not actually in the, um, available in the port by default in the rc.d file, but that was an easy enough fix. And then this problem went away. I guess the upshot of that was, for me, the, the value in the FreeBSD community is if you can do a good bug report, um, then there is someone who will probably be able to help you. Um, and perhaps if you can't do a good bug report, you, you might be a little more stuck. That's worth spending the time in to collect the information. So, the sacred beast of sysadmins, the hardy yak, they who must be shaved. Um, as we're going through this migration, there were a lot of small little things that cropped up, and the interludes really are the big things that broke, the really painful things that took time and frustration, uh, but there are a lot of little pieces, and one of my learnings in hindsight was Triple the amount of time I assumed it would take, roughly, because, because of yaks that lined up to be shaved repeatedly. Some small yaks, some big yaks. And I, I, as, a, as an ex-manager, I don't think there's any way you can predict that. You just get used to your staff and go, OK, this person, when they say it's going to take two weeks, means four weeks. And this person means six weeks. Yeah, and maybe I'm a six-month type of guy. Yeah, so system and bat belt. Um, some of the stuff, I put a star by the logging, I'm not really going to cover that. I think we all know about logging, and it's really just a matter of picking a tool you like, and we didn't do anything exciting with that. Um, we did use Splunk, and um, that's expensive, so we stopped using that and used Greylog instead, which, as far as I can tell, is um, better for our use case, and the price is right. Um, Bolt is an interesting tool. It's a secrets management tool, and so, the easy thing to do as a software developer is, as you're developing it, you need some passwords, you stick them in your Git repo, works fine in your machine, and you don't think about how you're going to deploy that. So you just ship different passwords with that into production. If you're slightly clever, you'll put them in a separate file or something like that. 
but you end up in the state where these passwords are the things you really don't want exposed get stuck in the system. They, um, you don't have libraries that manage this at runtime, and you end up managing it at, at, at deploy time or install time. And so HashiCorp Vault effectively is a key value store where you can put secrets in and you can pull them out again. Um, it's reasonably new, maybe two or three years old, but it's really, really nice to use and it solves the problem of where am I going to put these secrets. There are a couple of nice things it does. I'll cover them on the next page. And the next three, four tools down the bottom, Collect D. How many people have used or know of Collect D? Very few, okay. So I'll spend a little bit more time on that. Riemann, probably even less. Awesome, yeah. So my goal here actually is um, to try and wean you off Nagios. Okay, that's last century's tech. It's time to go. And I'm pretty sure most people have used Grapha uh, Graphite or Grafana for storing data and sticking it on disk. Um, and I'm not even going to mention Jenkins. <laughs> so. so I'm not a cryptographer, but the Shamir secret algorithm is this idea where um, you can take a secret, um, and if you imagine it as a, as a ring of data, you can snip out segments of the ring, and if the rings overlap, um, then you can give each person a segment of the ring, and then you only need a fraction of those people to reconstruct the entire ring, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I don't know about the internals of Vault, but that's the general idea. We take this database that has all the secrets in it, and we have a single master ring, um, that is then with the keys then distributed amongst various members of the team. And when we restart Vault, um, or when we start it for the first time, we initialize this ring structure. It's um, kept in memory, and you have to have n members out of your ring to actually get access to the secrets. So choose that number wisely. If you take five members of, to be part of the ring, and um, you have five of them, and then one of them dies in a car accident, then no secrets. So there's a trade-off between having, say, three out of five. Um, is everyone going to be available? Are they in the right time zones? Are they in a place where they can use a secure computer? And you need to think about that sort of thing from, your, from the perspective of a threat model. Ours is very simple. We're expecting you to be at home on your normal work computer, not in a cafe, and you should be able to reach the people you're dealing with on a, some form of communication channel that you can verify, not IRC, that they're the people you're speaking to. So phone or video, we know each other's voices. And that way you can ask them from the workstation to log in, do their initialization with their key, then the next person does it, and after n people have done that, then the vault is available and up and running. Um, we use GitHub Auth um, as for when people are doing their normal day-to-day -day work. They don't have this magical ring pass, but they have a delegated one, and it allows them to read and write a subset of the keys in vault. And um, in future, um, Ansible itself will only have the right to read keys from the vault. It will be a simpler delegated privilege. And that was great. Um, there's a, a number of models for vault. You can deploy it in a compli complicated HA um, infrastructure. And again, having spent a lot of time with distributed systems, we just have one um, copy. Um, it's currently hosted in S3, and we will probably move that out to just um, a file backend and then back that up with Tarsnap, or maybe Tarsnap and Git. Um, the reality is if we have downtime and like, like we, lo we lose our main admin box and we need to restart that from scratch, um, the path from restoring to, from backup and deploying these things on a file system as opposed to getting set up with S3 and enabling all of that again, um, a file system is much, much simpler and I don't think it exposes us any more from a threat model. So the only other thing to add with Vault is some future plans. We would like to um, have um, app level tokens, so not just tokens for a database, but actually for an app application itself where it would get a transient key to RabbitMQ or a transient SSH key if it needs to transfer something over SSH. And this would be valid for a limited, um, quite a limited lifetime. Uh, but we haven't done that yet, and HashiCorp Vault does provide that in the future. So we'll, we'll definitely give that a go. This is a bit of a, a view of what it looks like. Um, numbers change to protect the innocent. Um, Vault is an HTTPS-based service. You need TLS um, minimum 1.2 to secure it. It works fine with Let's Encrypt, except you have to remember that every three months you roll a key, so every three months you've got to start and stop your vault, um, which is, an obvi is obvious in hindsight, um, maybe not so obvious up front. Um, 
using a token that you get from GitHub, you do an auth, and now you have a token, this long thing down here, and you can probably see it, there it is, token duration. Um, it's valid for a period, a given period of time. Uh, this is from the initial setup, so that's number is really long. Um, it's a lot less now. Um, so this gives you a nice trade-off. You can decide um, if you're maybe using some automated process in the same way you deal with a Kerberos ticket, you can say I want this to be valid for maybe a week, uh, and then it needs to be renewed weekly. For your admins, if people are traveling, you can restrict that right down and say maybe an hour or two or, or a day. It depends how keen people are on reauthing versus um, you know, preserving the security of the company. So, here we're just writing a secret to Vault. Um, we do not know who the Scarlet Pimpel is, so there's two key things here. Secret Black Adder, that is the key. This is a key value store. It is not some other complicated data structure store where you can um, use like a lens and grab and update a piece inside it. You have to update the whole thing at once. This is very important because if you get that wrong, you will lose secrets. So in the second line here, we um, update. Now we know who the Scarlet Pimpinel is. He's a Comte de Fufu. And then when we read it back, um, we notice that we see Comte de Fufu and we don't see, we do not know. They said that the key inside the key, that the value has actually been overwritten. Um, we get least duration time. Um, you can have it in YAML, you can have it in um, JSON, and you can just read out a single value um, in, in itself, write that to disk or, or do what else if you needed. Uh, it's great. I've not really seen anything like it. Um, I'd be really interested to hear from other people if they have something that, 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 that does that. So Ansible, this isn't an Ansible talk. We could go on for hours about these sorts of things. Um, we've got about 50 roles and most of them are custom because the way we sysadmin FreeBSD is I've got one specific thing, an rc.conf.d slash service name, conf file that settings go in there, and then I've got a daemon that I need to start and stop and possibly some related files. It's pretty contained like that. So most of these are custom, <coughs> uh, and they're not very exciting. Three or four lines of um, Ansible plus some templates. Um, the only big ops was that the native jail support in Ansible is only when you're running Ansible on your jail host talking to the jails, and it did not occur to me that this would be the case. So I'd done all my test and dev locally, it was all working brilliantly, and I said, okay, right, let's um, redo one of these cluster nodes and test it remotely. It didn't work. And I was going, crap, I've spent literally weeks assuming this would work. And thank God there's a fork of a fork um, with some patches that makes this work. And um, that, was, that was a bit of a stressful moment because my Python was not good enough to rewrite that stuff from scratch. Um, and Huge thanks to XMJ uh, on IRC, both for his Fractal Citadel stuff, which I looked at, and his Ansible plugin, and his moral support when he discovered that I didn't know this either. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I'm not sure if you can read this at the back. Um, probably not. Um, Ansible is, for better or worse, is YAML. In fact, I spent most of the last year writing YAML, um, actually. Yeah, I'm a YAML programmer. Um, the main things of interest is on the left here is our jail definition. So we have a, 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 a file where we've got config as a top level object, ISL, instances, and then under this thing IWM base. Um, and the config is pretty simple. It's more or less what you'd see in jail.conf. Um, it's an IPv4 address for the jail to be bound to, a bunch of packages that we want to have installed, um, and some down the bottom here in blue, some magical properties allow raw sockets. Um, I can't remember if we actually needed this in the end, but um, you can add those, the soft, um, those properties there. This Ansible role is not applied to the jail, it's applied to the base system, so it's in a separate file. And then over on the other side we have the app config that's actually get a, that actually gets applied to the jail. So Ansible has a connection plugin that um, pushes this data through. It's a catalyst app, we've got a primary port 5000, it's got a path to stuff some things for debug mode and test mode and all that sort of stuff. Um, this config setting here can vary depending on whether you're on a development box or a production one. So the way we say that I want Catalyst to spit out lots of debug information is just to update these things in Ansible and depending on whether it's production or development, different settings get applied. And that's, that's pretty good. Um, down here we've got magical tokens and there's a plugin we use, um, look up vault, the secret, this is the key, and this is the, um, the, the, the sub value we want within that key that gets pulled out. 
and return back uh, to Ansible. When Ansible runs then, it pulls all of these things out of Vault, it uses the auth token that I have that should still be valid. So this means if someone takes our Ansible scripts and, and steals them without that auth token, they can't get the secrets um, out of our production environments. And then um, it goes and pushes these into the right places. Unfortunately, many of the apps we use use file-based um, uh, tokens. So if you were to hack into the servers, then you would still be able to get those passwords. Um, but you'd at least have to get, in most cases, root privileges first to do so. It's a good compromise. It's not ideal. I would like a way to inject a secret into a process in such a way that it was only visible to that process. Right, so now we're actually inside the cluster. There's two nodes here. Um, I'm not a graphic designer. Yep. So one node along here, one node up the top. Um, here's our logical domain here from the network side of things. CARP failover, round robin DNS um, um, with a lag interface and also switch support configured as well um, upstream on the switch. And um, to be honest, once we set that up, I've not had to touch it since. It just works perfectly. Um, this sort of structure here, I'll point to the bottom one, it's the same top and the bottom. Um, HA proxy listens on both of these nodes, and as I said earlier, um, jails request access to HA proxy for a particular service, and the HA proxy will direct it either to the RabbitMQ, CouchDB, or Kyoto Tycoon database on the local node, or if that's not available, it flicks it through the tunnel to the top node, and that works very, very well. Um, a couple of problems related to RabbitMQ, which I'll touch on later, but otherwise this just, w this, this just works out of the box, and it's pretty very, very reliable. One of the nice things about, um, so you could do this with Nginx, but you have to buy a commercial Nginx license for that, and for this scale we are, we're not Google, we're not web scale, um, we measure our hits in you know, tens per second, not ten millions per second, we, we really don't need that. But what I did want is the ability to take off some of our services to do maintenance on them without having to interrupt customer requests or take parts of the app offline. And HAProxy allows us to turn um, a particular, say this uh, server here, or this connection here into maintenance mode. It will then drain the connections to it, and it will send new connections off through to the next other available node. Uh, and that's a really, really nice trick. Um, there are three or four modes for HAProxy in dealing with that, round robin and so forth. Um, there's an excellent talk, I think, by the CEO of Fastly, where he talks about the actual impact of these models in practice. Uh, and I should find a link and add that in the presentation, because that's well worth a read into understanding whether round robin or um, least loaded is, is, is your best choice. For us, to be honest, it probably doesn't really matter. And Lude the second. So, um, <coughs> We did the DB migration, we've got everything else, our first apps behind um, HA proxy, and I'm kind of relieved because it was a big step, uh, a big step to take. But we're also in this halfway house, we've got some stuff in Debian over here in the unreliable cloud, and we've got these databases in happy FreeBSD land um, running. And then one morning, everything wedged completely, absolutely everything, at exactly the same time. Very, very odd. Different cloud providers, some in VMs, some not. Um, in all cases, HA proxy had stalled. Um, from a daemon service perspective, it was up and running. If you went to create the stats, it was available, but it wasn't accepting new connections at all, and everything was down. Because the databases are behind it, they're also down from the point of view of the applications, and it was, well, luckily it was 9.30 in the morning. I was already sitting at my computer, and five minutes later, um, it's all back up and running but I was a little bit concerned. So I whipped out Dtrace to check one of the processes. Um, I got a panic on the box, and I was thinking, great, this is a really good story to take back to my colleagues about um, FreeBSD stability. Uh, and I couldn't get a core dump out of it either. So that's a bit frustrating. Summarize this, the situation, send off to the HA proxy list, and three other people replied and said, could you tell me exactly when that happened? Because we saw the same thing too. And within literally a couple of minutes, um, globally, there were a number of people seeing the same thing. The only common thread was FreeBSD 11, not X, doesn't matter what version of HA proxy you're running, doesn't matter if you're running Libre SSL or whatever. Um, this is a bit new to me, I've not really struck this sort of thing before and I had visions of 
um, little gremlins in the internet, sort of script kiddies hosing everything with some mysterious packet of death. Um, there are probably kernel developers and people have a lot more experience in that sort of thing. Does anyone have an idea what might that might be? Bonus prize if you can guess it. Quiet. Thank you for being honest. Yeah. Anyone else have any ideas? Um, it's a good idea, but no, we're all in different time zones. Uh, actually, we're all in UTC. No, no, it's another good, good guess. No. No. Although that's a thing we should get rid of as a matter of principle. Yeah, keep rolling your hand. That's exactly right. So bonus points to the man in the corner there. Well done. Um, so after I came up with my weird conspiracy theories, um, Willie Tarot um, replied um, and said, um, if I'm right, this will be about 49.7 days. Sounds like some sort of millisecond 32-bit timer rolling over. Never heard of that before in HA proxy, but it could be possible. Um, and long story short, we waited 49.7 days um, with the patch that um, I think was uh, 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 Olivier sent to us, and problem solved. And the answer was that um, I'm assuming that in 10.x, the port is still built with GCC, and with 11, um, it's built with Clang, or at least we were building it with Clang, and we used use this FRAP V flag to prevent rollover. Um, yeah, weird, that went away. And just uh, last week, I had the final confirmation. We all reported back that after another 49.7 days, no one had seen it. So I was kind of waiting a bit, thinking, uh, I hope that re really hope that doesn't come back. Um, and it's another case of running good bug reports, um, thankfully. Thankfully, we haven't seen that again, because that's really difficult when everything in infrastructure goes down all at once. <laughs> so this is the bit I enjoyed the most, to be honest. Um, I like monitoring. I like sitting at my desk. I'd like to have three large gummy bears, you know, bear, bear statues that um, glow blue when everything's fine, green when the builds are going, orange when something's wedged but production isn't down, and red when I should really be getting out of bed. That's, that's my dream of perfection. And of course, there are many yaks along this way to shave. Um, so you really need a pro ops um, yak herder Jedi. Uh, I'm not sure about the Jedi I added that yesterday to the presentation, but I'm definitely an ops yak herder. So the first part of this is collect D. Um, in every networking environment that I have used, um, there's always been at some point um, TCP um, ephemeral port exhaustion caused by badly written um, distributed systems. So badly written is perhaps a little unfair, but the guts of it is you've got to have exponential back off if you're running an application that is crossing the network boundary between boxes or servers or networks. And in my experience, very, very few people do this. So when there is an outage, their queue of transactions piles up, the network comes back up, um, and they immediately start hammering the box, saying, let me in, let me in. And if you have 20, 30 servers doing this, then that piles up very quickly. The way I've dealt with this in production is, and the new architecture has put effectively three limits in place. Um, ask people to rewrite the code politely. That may or may not happen, um, depending on constraints. Use PF on every single box to um, effectively throttle the connections at the server end. Restrict the number of connections with S pipe D, now that I know that you can actually do that, um, so that from one particular server back to a central database server, you can get a maximum of, say, 400 concurrent connections through that. And that just sort of slows everyone down. And then at the back end, the databases are quite capable of handling 10,000 concurrent connections. So that really isn't a problem. Uh, but out with, without, without using PF and S pipe D to sort of slow the, to, to nip the flow in a couple of places, you end up in this overflow situation. So to keep track of that, we've got sort of basic stuff in Collect D. Collect D is um, a daemon written in C. It's pretty low, um, um, low effort to config. And out of the box, you get all of those nice things, CPU, ZFS, disk-based memory. You can have per process stats. So unfortunately, I put the label in slightly the wrong place here, but you can actually see a process name or a process match in the middle here. And this is, allows you to match on, uh, let's say, TTY as a string. And you, you know, in your FreeBSD system, you're expecting to see a bunch of those, maybe, what is it, 8 or 12. And you can actually monitor that um, and see if these processes go down. 
because we're aggregating this over multiple systems, you can actually say, I need to always have at least two of these processes running somewhere in my environment, I don't care where. And then you move away from this per box monitoring problem of saying, whoops, thank you. Um, this per box monitoring problem of saying, um, how do I decide if, what happens if I reboot this box? Um, is it okay to reboot this box? You have this information from other servers. We also have custom stuff in there, RabbitMQ length. That's over an HTTP API to RabbitMQ. So it's pretty easy to throw in any sort of general query to a database that gives you back XML or uh, JSON or just some other number. We have basic thresholds in here, so I don't do anything fancy. I don't do anything comp computationally expensive. And CollectD sends its data back out um, over TCP um, through an SPIPE-D tunnel to our monitoring box. Now, this is the sort of stuff we get out of um, CollectD into Riemann. This is all in real time, so um, it's not historic, and with a bit of luck, the computing gods will have actually let me collect data while I'm talking here, and we can see little things moving along. HTTP response time, so this is actually from three or four, front end, uh, three or four nodes that provide DNS. They're continually querying our front-end web servers and saying, how quickly do you respond? It's just for the first primary website gets, but it gives you a really quick view if something has changed um, from the network side of things, are we seeing really slow response times from a particular area of the world? Um, memory and disk, this stuff here is our TCP connections. This is the piece that really enabled me to narrow down really quickly um, why I was having, why my s d tunnels weren't working as expected, and what I used to establish load testing beforehand. Uh, and that's just collect, collect D. I only graph two states established in time weight. Um, and that seems to be enough most of the time to, to know what's going on. Riemann is a tool written in Clojure, and I'm not a great Clojure person, um, so I've tried to keep this as simple as possible. This is a snippet from our config file, and the way to think of Riemann is a bit like you're standing at the top of a mountain with a huge stack of events, and there are three or four rivers down below you, and you're th sorting these events. Sometimes you want to throw the event into three of the rivers, um, sometimes it just goes into one bucket, so all of the collect D stuff goes into another bucket, all of our custom written app stuff goes into another bucket, and then within that, within the stream, you can decide, okay, for this host and this service, I want to, for example, count that there's at least one of these processes running on it. Um, or I might want to say, um, this particular one here, you can probably see in the middle this really long line, curl, JSON, RabbitMQ, gauge, total messages, should be reasonably obvious. It's the output of the JSON API for RabbitMQ of the number of messages currently um, not delivered in RabbitMQ. So that's my big backlog. If something goes down in the system, that number will go up very quickly. And for that, I'm going to say I want a time to live of two minutes. I'm going to rename it to something a bit more comprehensible, RabbitMQ backlog, and I'm going to tag it as notify. Um, this large clause here um, in this lispy flavoured language says um, if the state is expired, which means I'm no longer receiving messages at all from that service, like if you turn it off, um, then change the state to critical and re-inject it, put it back at the top of the mountain so it flows down the path to critical page, someone get them out of bed. Um, and the same thing if it's okay we re-inject, and that seems odd, why would we re-inject an okay message? And the answer is because if you pay someone to get them out of bed, and they get to the computer and find out the system fixed itself, they'll be really annoyed. Um, and this is the piece that says, oh, the system's back up and running. Um, integrating to PagerDB, it turns the alarm off and goes back to sleep. Yeah, um, and then finally, we send all this stuff off to Graphite so we can have pretty pictures for historic viewing. Um, I just stuck this into ZFS, and um, one of the problems with Graphite is you've always got to decide how to um, aggregate your data over time. I don't. I tell ZFS, compress it, sort it out and um, seven years of data comes up to like something like 60, 70 gigs. It's a bit slow to query some time, but it's not really a major problem. So these are the real-time graphs. That's the sort of thing you get out in Graphite, and we'll have a look at this. Um, this is this event here, the, the RabbitMQ monitoring in OK state. Everything's green, and then when it fails, it goes up into orange. So most of the time I have a, a window just sitting there like that, and I have a look periodically to see if it's if it's going orange, it's simply getting paged. Now we're going on time here. Okay. We'll just go to interlude two and then we can have a look at some real time stuff. 
So interlude the third, um, the databases have moved, the message queues have moved, the primary application has moved, um, let's move the back-end job queue processes, um, which is a bunch of um, a, a pill demon. Um, a bit like the Star Wars thing, I decided to go on holiday in two weeks, starting on Saturday, because it lines up with the school holidays and we're all going as a family, and I don't want to take my computer. Um, long story short, move the job queues, major backup problems with the monitoring we've just seen, but the site is still usable, and the stars are there because usable depends on exactly what you mean by usable. Um, some connections to RabbitMQ are decidedly flaky, and they just fall over, and we don't really know why yet. Um, so I tweak all the things. This is things like syscontrols that we've um, set. I untweak them, reboot stuff. Um, does it work? I check the tunnels. I double check the tunnels. I turn P off everywhere. PF off, PF the firewall off everywhere. It's not the firewall. Turn it back on. Um, and slow panic sets in to me, not to the servers. And this is, I think, uh, Wednesday or Thursday. I think it was Wednesday. And at a, almost midnight on Friday evening, I suddenly work out what it is after reading some TCP dump in grep um, very closely. My personal learning from this is go for TCP dump much, much, much earlier. Every time I use TCP dump, I've always said the same thing. I wish I'd done that half a day or an hour ago, two hours ago. Uh, my bad. So. The setup we had for HA Proxy um, is tuned for HTTP Keep Alive and um, also designed to make sure that our um, third party API clients um, don't misbehave. So if they don't send any data, whoosh, I cut them off. Um, unfortunately, RabbitMQ, so it's a reverse proxy TCP connection, not an HTTP one. RabbitMQ as a messaging queue could sit there for several days with absolutely no traffic. Um, HA proxy has TCP keep alive at the bottom, so the operating systems are, are aware there's a connection, but at the application level, there's no traffic passing, and so HA proxy itself doesn't see these keep alive messages being passed on each end of the connection, so it was closing the connections if there was no data, um, and that was what was breaking this back end stuff. Um, yeah, so queues with no message volume would have their TCP sessions dropped. And the Perl daemon that restarted these workers when they finished their work or when they died wasn't quite fast enough to keep up with these jobs when they came into production. So we'd see a, a backlog creep up and then we'd catch up and tail down again. Um, the fix was to enable, um, um, so RabbitMQ uses a messaging protocol called AMQP. Um, I think I got that right. And heartbeats should be enabled by default in all clients, but are obviously not. So in some of the libraries we could enable it, in the Perl one we couldn't. Um, and so the solution was just simply to change the, uh, we we're missing a bit of text, change the HA proxy idle time to three days. Problem solved, and I go on holiday, but I did take the laptop just in case. Yeah, but that was, that was touch and go. I left, uh, I think it was like six in the morning the next day, and I had to wait till 1 a.m. so I could call my colleague in New Zealand and tell him I know what the problem is, and you're going to like it. <laughs> We fixed it. So, um, prize for anyone who can tell me where that is. It's on the east coast of New Zealand, uh, just south of Kaipara. Not bad, no, not bad. You're right, it is in New Zealand though. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, it's all it's Stewart Island, it's the bottom end of New Zealand. Um, 20,000 Kiwis live here. This is furry Kiwi birds, not Kiwi Kiwis like me. Um, beautiful place. Um, no computers. Very good if you want to get away from cell phone reception. Lovely. So some thoughts and wants. Previously as interstellar ninja hipster tech, but for someone like me who's not great on networking, I got a bit lost, and I think in hindsight um, that was something that really slowed me down. I don't know what an e-pair is, a ton of tap. I thought I knew what a clone interface was, but it turns out I don't. Um, how to make typical jail networks seems obvious in hindsight, but it really isn't at the beginning and you've got to make a decision between how do you get your traffic in and out of the jail and how do you make the decision on how permissive this jail should be in relation to network traffic. Should it be able to access other jails? Do you want to talk to services on your host? Do you use PF to control it? Do you use HA proxy? Um, some guidelines will be nice. I noticed that no one can agree whether V image is safe or not. Um, we don't use it, but I'd love to have PF directly inside the jail. So I'd like someone to answer that for me. And if Jail.conf from PFConf and OpenBGP would have a baby and dress it in ZFS dataset properties, I would be really happy. Um, I think this is the learning I've seen from, from Docker. I'll mention it once because otherwise I get post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, 
Docker provided people with an API for packaging stuff up that included the networking and some file system bits with a very, very primitive, um, non idempotent way of doing builds. And it turns out it was enough for people. And so we have all these bits in FreeBSD that are, generally speaking, far, far better, but they're not packaged up. And so once you know them, you call them together yourself, you build your own Lego and go, it's awesome. But there's a piece missing there, and that, I think that's the piece that is the on-ramp for future BSD users and developers who are missing that. Um, LibXO is awesome. I want it everywhere, all the time. And in fact, I want it streaming so that I can connect it up to RabbitMQ, things like this, and then make decisions across my infrastructure um, rather than in a single place. It may well be this is already possible. I don't know about it. Um, I'd like to have the at symbol in GCOS fields um, because then I can put email addresses for demons and services in there. There's a patch for it. I couldn't find the POSIX standard that says is that or isn't allowed. Maybe it's true. Systemd is not something I enjoyed particularly because it changed over time with every Linux release, but it is a very simple way of describing what a job should and shouldn't do. And when you're writing your own apps, when you're writing a new daemon for, uh, like a, a new port for FreeBSD, you typically cobble together bits of someone else's shell script. And over time you learn to do this a lot better, but what I learned from systemd is having a single flat config file that covers 90% of people's needs means that people don't screw daemons up. And I think I've submitted at least three patches for other people's daemons and several patches for my own daemons as I learned more on how to do that properly. Dtrace and tdump are awesome. Um, I would love to have TCP support for base syslog D. Um, in practice, I rip it out and put um, R syslog in. But the problem you have with a jail is if you want to get TCP uh, syslog data out of the jail, you do that over UDP. And then you need a PF rule to make sure that people from the outside can't spam your um, your UDP logs, so that kind of would be nice. And I know Alan Jude told me it wasn't possible, but I really would like something like ZFS send for FreeBSD update. So that instead of downloading 3,072 patches, it would just go, here's one I prepared earlier, done. <laughs> um, I think that's all I had. Questions, if people have got them? Oh, thanks. I started off doing this, thanks. The list got really long. Um, your name probably isn't there. When we come to these conferences, we get an opportunity to say thank you. And so, thank you. Um, these are the people who helped. There's some right at the top. Um, Ed Masters, one of the first who fixed the um, sizing on my laptop. It used to be the screen was this size in the middle of a big black boundary. And that wasn't really very conducive to doing work with FreeBSD. Once it was full screen, that's really what started this migration path three odd years ago. So those little bits for newcomers who are struggling around literally in the dark uh, makes a big difference. And those are all the people that helped. Um, in particular, I want to mention um, Matt Macy for his DM, DRM Next work. That's enabled my colleagues to use FreeBSD. It's what made this presentation possible. And I think people underestimate how important it is to be able to dog food the operating system you're using. So, big thanks to Matt. Yeah. Uh, anyway, any questions? I think I've probably, probably gotten to the end of my time now, haven't I? So how did you find FreeBSD? Uh, I'll do a shortened version of the story. A colleague, when I was working at the University of New Zealand uh, 25 years ago, said, hey, I have this FreeBSD free thing, it's awesome. I ignored him. And then I picked up 2.8, um, OpenBSD from a colleague in, I was in France at the time, because uh, I wanted to learn more about Unix. And I got started there with great man pages. And um, then I picked up FreeBSD later because I was using Erlang. It has Dtrace support. Dtrace didn't run on the computer I was using. I went to find a computer that would run Dtrace. Yeah, so that's how it's, how it's all started, Dtrace. So how do you know when you're reaching proxy? Process disappears when it's time to fail. Ah, um, the short answer is I don't bother with that. It turns out it's not really necessary. <laughs> so that's pretty, that's pretty funny. Um, in practice, I have monitoring, so monitoring will tell me something's down. I don't think uh, my colleagues would know necessarily what the problem is. And there are a couple of solutions for this around doing like a little loop and a, a DFD check. Um, yeah, that would be a thing I should fix. Yeah, yeah. I've seen at least two articles on on the internet about people doing this. So I don't imagine it's particularly difficult. Yeah. Good point. So how much resistance was there in your organization to moving away from Linux? Oh, none, really. It's a bit of embarrassment. Um, 
but he just said, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> maybe, maybe, I don't know where Lee is, maybe he can speak to that, but um, uh, one of my colleagues um, is the founder of the company, he's a long time FreeBSD user, and now he's also back on TrueOS on his laptop as a result of this. So it's kind of cheating, yeah. yeah. The, we were preaching to the converted. Um, I think we were all very frustrated with the status quo from a stability point of view and a customer point of view, and we wanted to change some stuff. And it was a more a matter of framing it up, saying here are the problems we have, and here is a way of dealing with it. Anyone else? Great. Um, if you're interested in more stuff, like I know that sometimes it's hard to go, what are those words in the screenshot? The slides are on the um, site, my contact details are there, and in the next couple of weeks I'm going to blog all the, in long form, all the little bits that I glossed over, like how does Collect D work, what do we do with Rem and that stuff, so you actually have configs to look at if people want to play with that. Thank you.